on World News Tonight. Deadly explosion. Blast in Dhaka kills scorches of people, injuring many with a death toll expected to rise. Potential conflict. China's foreign minister says US needs to change course with China or risk conflict. Concerning plans. UN warns against a UK draft law that could lead to an asylum ban. And happy holy. India celebrates the festival of colors with bursting vibrant tints welcoming spring. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight, reporting from Colombo. Here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. A very good evening to all our viewers joining us on World News Tonight on this International Women's Day. Now our top story tonight is on the deadly explosion in Bangladesh. An explosion rippled through a building in a crowded area of Bangladesh's capital, killing at least 19 people and injuring more than 50 others. The death toll could still rise according to local media. Madid Uddin Kondeka, additional commissioner of the Dhaka Metropolitan Police, said the cause of the blast was unknown, but it may have been a gas explosion. Not many people were inside the building at the time of this blast, but its location on a busy road near a market meant pedestrians were impacted. The blast occurred at the seventh floor building, which housed several stores for sanitary items. It also reportedly shattered the glass walls of a bank branch located in the building adjacent to it. Bangladesh has a history of industrial disasters, including factories catching fire with workers trapped inside. Monitoring groups have blamed corruption and lax enforcement. Last year, a fire at the shipping container storage depot near the country's main Shittagong seaport killed at least 41 people, including nine firefighters, and injured more than 100 others. Now, families of those on board Malaysia Airlines Flight 370, which disappeared mysteriously nine years ago today, have called on the Malaysian government to allow U.S. seabed exploration firm Ocean Infinity to mount a new search for the missing plane. The fate of Flight MH370 became one of the world's greatest aviation mysteries when it disappeared en route from Kuala Lumpur to Beijing on March 8, 2014, with 239 people on board, including six Australians. In 2018, Malaysia engaged Ocean Infinity to search for the aircraft in the southern Indian Ocean, offering to pay up 70 million US dollars if it found the plane, but its operation came up short. Ocean Infinity and Malaysia's Transport Ministry did not immediately respond to a request for comment, but in a message to families read out at the memorial event, Transport Minister Anthony Loke vowed not to close the book on MH370, adding that due consideration would be given to future searches if there was a new and credible information on the aircraft's potential location. Debris confirmed or believed to be from the MH370 aircraft has washed up along the African coast and on islands in the Indian Ocean. China's new foreign minister has said in a fiery press conference that the U.S. and China are heading towards inevitable conflict if Washington does not change its approach. He also defended his country's strengthening relationship with Russia, saying it was the country's own decision on who it supports and vice versa. Fiery words from Beijing's new foreign minister today. <laughs> saying the U.S. needs to change course or risk confrontation and conflict with China, echoing China's President Xi Jinping a day earlier, making rare comments accusing the U.S. of leading an all-around containment, encirclement and suppression of China. The escalation in rhetoric demonstrating unprecedented tensions between the two superpowers. This is not about containing China. This is not about suppressing China. This is not about holding China back. Tensions have ratcheted up since the U.S. shot down that Chinese spy balloon. And the U.S. warned that China was considering sending weapons to Russia for the war in Ukraine. Russia fighting now to capture Bakhmut in eastern Ukraine but running so low on ammunition, its forces have been fighting with shovels, according to British intelligence. This as China is flexing its military muscles over the South China Seas, flying 500 feet off the wing of this U.S. Navy surveillance plane last month, and continuing to threaten the self-governing island of Taiwan, which China views as its territory. And President Biden has said the U.S. would defend if attacked. 
Now, the Biden administration has backed a bipartisan bill that would give Washington the power to ban the Chinese-owned video app TikTok in the United States. The bill, introduced by a dozen Republicans and Democrats in the Senate, would allow U.S. President Joe Biden to ban technologies deemed by the U.S. Commerce Department to pose an undue or unacceptable risk to national security. The White House said Tuesday it backed legislation by a bipartisan group of a dozen senators to give the administration new powers to ban Chinese-owned video app TikTok and other foreign-based technologies if they pose national security threats. The endorsement boosts efforts by a number of lawmakers who want to rein in the popular app used by more than 100 million Americans. You got 100 million Americans, 90 minutes a day. Democratic Senator Mark Warner, who chairs the Intelligence Committee, said the bill gives the Commerce Department the ability to impose restrictions up to and including banning TikTok and other technologies. I absolutely believe that China, with its authoritarian values dominating those technologies, is not in the national security interest of our country or, for that matter, people across the world who don't live in authoritarian regimes. Warner said it would also apply to foreign technologies from China, Russia, North Korea, Iran, Venezuela, and Cuba. TikTok said in a statement that any U.S. ban on TikTok is a ban on the export of American culture and values to the billion-plus people who use our service worldwide. The bill would require the Commerce Secretary to identify and address foreign threats to information and communications technology products and services. Warner said it was important the government do more to make clear what it believes are the national security risks to the U.S. from the use of TikTok. Still, an outright ban of TikTok in the United States seems improbable to some experts, like Shuman Gosmajumder, a former fraud czar at Google. TikTok, the ByteDance-owned app, has come under increasing fire over fears user data could end up in the hands of the Chinese government, undermining Western security interests. TikTok chief executive Xu Zi Chu is due to appear before Congress on March 23rd. France was partly brought to a standstill as millions of protesters took to the streets in one of the biggest strike actions yet, rejecting the government's proposed pension reform bill, which includes raising the legal retirement age from 62 to 64. Workers across all sectors turned out in force to show their disapproval in nationwide demonstrations. For the sixth time this year, tens of thousands march in Paris. Unions say more than 300 demonstrations are being held across France to say none to the government's plan to raise the retirement age from 62 to 64. I can say that today's mobilization is a historic one in the past 40 to 50 years in terms of turnout. There are strikes and mobilizations in all sectors, responding well to our call to bring France to a standstill. In parallel to street protests, Large chunks of France's workforce have stopped working, with some unions calling for open-ended strikes in strategic sectors. Many schools are shut as teachers walked out. All shipments of oil in the country have been halted amid strikes at refineries. Lorry drivers have blocked or slowed down traffic on major roads. Most long-distance trains and many flights have been cancelled. Bing collectors have blocked access to incineration plants around the capital. Protesters blame the government for the disruptions, accusing them of ignoring the voices of the public. The government is blocking the country. The people want to do everything they can to unblock the country by having that reform plan withdrawn. Currently, the Senate is debating the reform bill, which will then go back to the lower house of parliament. We think that the pressure of the street can make a change. We'll keep going till the end, until the government buckles and accepts the decision of the street. Public opinion remains largely in favour of the strikes. The government insists the reform is necessary to prevent the pension system from going bankrupt. Now, there was a major announcement coming out of Seoul and Washington overnight. The leaders of the two countries will hold a summit next month in Washington, D.C., marking 70 years of their security alliance. The extended deterrence against North Korea will be among the top agendas. 
President Yoon seok yeol is set to hold back-to-back -back summits with the leaders of the United States and Japan in the coming weeks, accelerating efforts to jointly address security threats including North Korea and economic challenges. Seoul's top office said on Wednesday that Yoon will visit Washington, D.C. next month, marking the first South Korean state visit to the U.S. since 2011. With a state dinner slated for April 26, Presidents Yoon and Joe Biden will hold talks under the theme of Alliance in Action. During his visit to D.C. this week, National Security Advisor Kim jong un said the focus would be on protecting peace and stability on the Korean Peninsula, which he called the basis of the 70-year alliance. Kim said the leaders would seek ways to qualitatively strengthen the Allies' capability to offset North Korea's nuclear weapons, noting that the U.S. has reasserted its commitment to extend the deterrence, with joint military exercises and the deployment of various U.S. strategic assets as a measure to build trust. On the trade front, Kim added that Seoul will also seek measures to minimize damage to South Korean firms hit by Washington's policies that support domestic production of key industrial products, such as semiconductors. Other agendas for the two leaders are cooperation on advanced technologies, economic security and people-to-people -people exchanges, taking the alliance further beyond the realm of military ties. In this regard, the two leaders are expected to discuss furthering their cooperation with Japan, following recent efforts by Seoul and Tokyo to overcome their long-standing disputes. South Korea's plan to compensate Japan's wartime forced labor victims through voluntary donations from the private sector has been challenged domestically but has drawn a positive response from the U.S. and Japan. According to Japanese media, Tokyo's ruling party chief Natsuo Yamaguchi said on Tuesday that Seoul-Tokyo relations have reached an important turning point, with Prime Minister Fumio Kishida expressing willingness to meet President Yoon even later next week. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back. Now, plans to set up a new drone command in the South Korean military to counter related incursions are taking shape, with officials pointing to July as a possible month to mark its opening. In the latest efforts to beef up South Korea's defense, the country's Joint Chiefs of Staff will launch a new drone operations command as early as this July. This, according to military officials on Wednesday. The new establishment will bolster readiness against any potential drone threats from North Korea. The military is looking to move things forward after North's drone incursion last year and is aiming to set up a new command in just six months after it rolled out its plan to do so in January. Last December, five unmanned aerial vehicles from the north infiltrated South Korea's airspace and flew for hours around the capital region without being shot down. This raised concerns about the North's drone offensives and the South's defense capabilities. So the South Korean military is hoping to build an airtight unit in a short time by analyzing and taking tips from its allies. For instance, they recently visited Turkey's drone brigade for insights in operation and strategy. Turkey's brigade is equipped with a Bayraktar TB2, an unmanned combat aerial vehicle that Ukraine has used against Russian forces. The military is still figuring out the details, but the Pochon area of Gyeonggi-do province, near the border with North Korea, seems to be a likely candidate for the base of the new unit. Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has called for a review of foreign interference in his country's elections and will appoint an independent special investigator to probe alleged Chinese meddling in Canada's polls. Canada's Justin Trudeau ordered investigations into alleged interference by China in his country's recent elections. In a press briefing, Trudeau said he would appoint an impartial expert. We will appoint an eminent Canadian to the position of independent special rapporteur who will have a wide mandate to make expert recommendations on protecting and enhancing Canadians' faith in our democracy. The independent special rapporteur will make public recommendations which could include a formal inquiry or some other independent review process. He also urged Parliament's National Security Panel to launch a separate probe into foreign election meddling. Trudeau has been under fire from critics for his handling of the controversy. 
Canadian media ran stories alleging covert Chinese schemes of meddling in the 2019 and 2021 elections. In one report, the Globe and Mail said Chinese diplomats worked to defeat Trudeau's rivals, the Conservatives, in the 2021 polls because they were considered more hostile to Beijing. Trudeau and Canada's top security officials have acknowledged interference attempts by China, but they insist that outcomes of both elections were not altered. A recent poll showed a majority of Canadians wanted their leader to respond more forcefully to the controversy. China denies all allegations of interference, saying it has no interest in meddling with Canada's internal affairs. Britain has set out details of a new law barring the entry of asylum seekers arriving in small boats across the channel, a proposal some charities say could be impractical and criminalise the efforts of thousands of genuine refugees. The UN warns against a British draft law calling for more humane solutions instead. Week after week, dozens of people put their lives at risk, crossing the channel in makeshift boats to reach the UK. But their treatment once they get there is on the verge of changing. Rishi Sunak's government has unveiled a new law that would remove migrants that have reached Britain illegally and cap the number of refugees entering the country. They will not stop coming here until the world knows that if you enter Britain illegally, you will be detained and swiftly removed. Yeah. Removed back to your country if it's safe or to a safe country, a safe third country, like Rwanda. The controversial Rwanda deal involved paying the Rwandan government to receive asylum seekers from the UK, but the deal was never implemented due to legal challenges. 2022 saw a record 45,000 people arriving in the UK by boat, and 31 dying in the attempt. The government says the new bill would stop the business of people smugglers, but activists argue that the plan is unethical and that it won't deter people from crossing the channel. Britain receives fewer asylum seekers than other European nations like Italy, Germany or France. But as part of his party's Brexit plan to take back control of Britain's borders, Rishi Sunak has made curbing small boat crossings a top priority. The issue is likely to be on the agenda when he meets with his French counterpart Emmanuel Macron at a bilateral summit in Paris on Friday. A general strike is being observed across the occupied West Bank one day after Israeli forces killed six Palestinians and wounded dozens of others. Businesses in cities including Jenin, Nablus and Ramallah shut their doors on Wednesday morning in response to these killings. The following visuals of this story is graphic. Viewer discretion is strictly advised. A raid by Israeli forces on a refugee camp in the West Bank city of Jenin on Tuesday left at least six Palestinians dead. Among them was a Hamas gunman suspected of shooting two brothers from a Jewish settlement near Huwara last week. Witnesses said gunfire erupted when residents saw Israeli soldiers get out of a truck overlooking the camp. They later surrounded a house and used shoulder-fired missiles against the building, said the Israeli military. Along with the six dead, several others were wounded, including one member of the Israeli police force. A funeral procession was held for the dead as the Israeli military identified the gunman as Abdel Fattah Karusha and said his two sons were also detained. The shooting in Huwara last week sparked a backlash from settlers described as a pogrom by a senior Israeli commander. The village was the scene of more violence Monday night. This CCTV video shows Israeli settlers attacking a Palestinian family outside a supermarket. They were shooting at us with live ammunition, said Omar Khalifa. His wife was in the back of the car with their daughter Tia. This video shows her crying as she's treated from tear gas spray. We could have lost my daughter, he said. There was real danger to our lives. Israeli forces have killed more than 70 Palestinians since the beginning of the year, including militant fighters and civilians. At least 13 Israelis and one Ukrainian woman have been killed by Palestinians during the same period. 
U.S. officials continue to call for calm, but there is no sign the violence will let up. Welcome back. And for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Five women who said they were denied abortions despite grave risks to their lives have sued the state of Texas in the first apparent case of pregnant women suing over curbs imposed after the U.S. Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade last June. The California Highway Patrol of Truckee released a video of police officers holding a sign reading free snow as snow fell around him and a bulldozer removed tons of snow from the ground. According to the UC Berkeley Central Sierra Snow Lab has received approximately 16 feet of snow in the last two weeks as a winter storm lashes the state. Two or four Americans kidnapped by gunmen after they drove into northeast Mexico were found dead and U.S. officials confirmed the two survivors have returned to the United States. The freed Americans were transported back across the border to U.S. authorities. Spain's ruling Socialist Party deepened a rift with junior coalition partner Unidas Podemos by seeking to close a loophole in a new sexual violence law that convicted rapists have used to reduce their sentences or win early release. Georgian police used tear gas to disperse protesters in central Tbilisi after Parliament gave its initial backing to a draft law on foreign agents, which critics say represents an authoritarian shift in the South Caucasus country. Residents of central Philippine province affected by an oil spill from a sunken tanker endured the powerful stench of petroleum as they cleaned it up using buckets and mugs while authorities raised to contain environmental damage. And that is all from us here at World News Tonight. Join us again tomorrow as we keep you up to date with the latest from around the world. In case you miss any of the stories tonight, you can always watch the whole program on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. And finally, we leave you tonight with the Holy Festival of Colors coming to a close in India as Hindus smear themselves in vibrant colors. Thank you for watching. Have a great night.